Hello, welcome to Hot Issues. January 7 has been set aside as National Constitutional Day, but there have been questions of whether really there is something worth celebrating for a day like that. It's been 27 years since uh, the 1992 Constitution has been in force. Today, we're fortunate to have with us Dr. Nana S.K.B. Asante, who was the chairperson of the Committee of Experts, which led to the studying of the initial report that led to the, led to the drafting of the 1992 Constitution. Nana, it's great to have you on Hot Thank Issues. You. And You're we're honored to be given the privilege to be in your home for You're welcome. Uh, this interaction. Yeah. The critical question is whether there is anything to celebrate for January 7, which has been set aside as National Constitutional Day. Is it worth it? Most certainly, in my view. <clears throat> we have, um, for the past 27 years, enjoyed constitutional and democratic um, order, which has been hailed uh, around the world. Um, we have been commended internationally as an oasis of uh, a liberal constitutional order in a very turbulent region. Um, we are touted as uh, the pace setter of democracy in Africa. All that is based on the Constitution. Sometimes we celebrate the Fourth Republic without celebrating the foundation of the Fourth Republic, which is the 1992 Constitution. So I think <clears throat> certainly it's worth celebrating. We have a Constitution which um, makes the most elaborate provisions for the protection of fundamental rights and human um, freedoms. Um, we have a constitution which has enabled us to organize elections uh, resulting in the transfer of power from one party to another on three or four occasions. Um, we have never had any real constitutional crisis within the past 27 years. So we have a lot to uh, be thankful for. We are stable, and uh, our economy is uh, on firm foundation. Um, there's no social conflict of any significance. Uh, Ghana is not torn by any um, internal rifts or conflicts like many other developing countries. Mm. So the Constitution has to be celebrated for that. Of course, there are people who criticize this and that. With the constitution, but the constitution is the basic law of the land. A basic law has to be respected. If you don't respect the basic law, then the foundation of stability is not there. It's not. It's, it's not worth okay. it. Yeah. But but twenty seven years. Yes. Would you say that it has outlived its usefulness? And no, perhaps it's time not. for us to get a new constitution. It's not outlived its usefulness. If you look at the constitution, <clears throat> where. Um, mandated by our terms of reference to build the Constitution on certain basic principles. First, a president elected by universal adult suffrage, who was supposed also to have a prime minister who would command a majority in parliament, who was supposed to have members of uh, parliament also elected by universal adult suffrage. It was supposed to have a constitution which guarantees uh, the freedom of the media, uh, which guarantees the protection of fundamental human rights, a constitution which sets out the directive principles of state policy, uh, a constitution which um, has um, um, a viable local government system, all these things, um, most of them have been properly achieved. And so <laughs> I say that the Constitution, as a liberal constitutional order, has not outlived its usefulness. Yes, certain aspects could be ch changed or straightened. But to say that it's a use, outlived its usefulness is to, uh, as it were, knock down the foundation of all that has been said in praise of Ghana's governance system. You can't praise the governance system of Ghana 
without recognizing the effectiveness of our constitution. And uh, I, I asked that question on the back of the fact that about five years or so ago, the Constitutional Review uh, Commission finished its work. There were recommendations made government uh, put out a white paper. But it doesn't seem that we, as a country, are ready to review those aspects. Recommended that we review. Well, that is one issue. But from another point of view, this speaks to the viability of the 1992 Constitution. We started talking about the review in um, 2010, you remember? Yeah. For nine, nine years, we talked about the review and so well, nothing has happened. Look at what's happened in 1991, 92. Um, the Constitution went through three stages, the formulation of the Constitution. First, the issuance of the, um, the report of the National Commission for Democracy that is evolving through democracy by Justice Anan, which uh, recommended a multi-party system. That was in March 1991. Then our report, the report of the Committee of Experts on Proposals of the Constitution was issued on July 31st. In August, the Constitutional Assembly was established, August 1991. By March 1992, they had finished their report and submitted it uh, to the PNDC. We then uh, organized a referendum in April 1992. What I'm trying to say is that within barely one year, the whole constitutional process was exhausted and completed. Would you say that was short? It was short, but it was effective. We were able to do it. Now, we have been attempting to review this constitution for the past so many years. We haven't been able to do it. So it, talks, it speaks to the essential validity and strength of the constitution. So anybody talking about outliving, uh, you know, it's outliving, it's usefulness, uh, in my view, uh, it has got the wrong end of the stick. Yes, there are aspects of the Constitution which have to be looked at. There are aspects of uh, our own way of operating a multi-party system, um, <clears throat> which are not necessarily traceable to the Constitution, which we have to review in order to make the system more viable. Are you able to give examples of these? Yes, yes, I am able to give a few examples. <clears throat> we go back to the uh, presidential powers. If you look at what happened in You would think that presidential powers are excessive? Yes, I think so. I think so. Um, and not only do I think so, but in fact more have, powers have been added. If you look at the Presidential Transition Act, Powers in 1210, which ordains that on the coming into uh, and the election of any president, on the swearing in of a new president, all boards of statutory corporations will be dissolved and new directors appointed. This was something which was passed after the Constitution but it gives enormous patronage powers to the president. It enhances the presidential power to make appointments because balls are all dissolved, new directors have been appointed until the, uh, the Supreme Court made its decision a few months ago. Even chief executives of this corporation were supposed to be removed. Now that was not dictated by the constitution. It was something which our own idea of presidential power uh, uh, now, the reason why I'm citing this, this example is that in my submission, which I have set out in that lecture, yeah. the lecture which I delivered at Legon mm -hmm. uh, in 2017 on the evolution of Ghana's constitution, constitution, both sides of the political divide were interested in excessive presidential powers. When a particular party is out of power, it will complain. When it's in power, it will never complain. And I'm yet to see any um, manifesto. Ma manifesto which has said, we hereby demand that on coming to power, we will work towards the, the powers of the executive. <laughs> I have not seen one. If you, you are press people, if you see one, tell me. Because 
the politicians feel that this is a price that they must campaign for and actually struggle to get. Once they've got it, give them patronage and they enjoy it. And nobody is really interested. Mm, but with in these powers, is it, is it, does it look like the constitution can still serve us for another 27 years, for example, with these excessive powers? Or you would recommend that? Oh, as I would recommend. Mm. I would recommend that any part of our multi-party system which tends to overemphasize exclusive power Pass. in the hands of one party, the monopoly of the levers of economic and political power, to the detriment of our national development plans, should be looked at mm. and, 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 and redressed. redressed. And I say that in the light of my experience, my international experience. I worked in the World Bank from 1966 to 1969. I was the first African to be appointed uh, to the legal department of the World Bank. And I was sent to Korea <clears throat> with a team of um, other international officials and private banks to help establish the Korea Development Finance Corporation. At that time, the per capita income of Korea was no higher than that of Ghana. And at that time, Korea, South Korea was emerging from the Korean conflict. It was a poor country by any standards. Now, they then decided that they would set about reforming the educational system as the foundation of the economic takeoff. And they decided, on a national basis, mm. that they would tackle um, primary education in the 1960s, that's when I was there. The following decades, 1970, they would tackle secondary education so that by the end of 1970, every Korean would have received um, secondary, secondary education. And then they tackled uh, tertiary education in the 1980s. Now, I gave a lecture uh, at New Year's School on the, <clears throat> the um, Ghana's experience the last 50 years, 2007. And I pointed out that at that time, the World Bank did a report saying that Korea was among the, the top economies of the country. It was the 12th largest economy, and Korean students were among the best in mathematics in and world. science. That's where they are. Mm -hmm. By a deliberate national policy of setting out their priorities and following through. So your, your view is that we shouldn't uh, confuse our inability to uh, move forward yes. our country in yes. development yes. to the weakness or strengths of the constitution? No, um, we should not. We should not because the constitution under the director principles of state policy was um, envisaged in long-term development. And that's why we established the National uh, Planning, Commission. Planning Commission. But the, nat <coughs> the nature of things is that um, because of this four year cyclical uh, competition of programs and so forth, you've never been able to get a national consensus on our development plan. In fact, the Constitution stipulates. And you think that's harmful? Yes, I think that is harmful. The Constitution has stipulated that within 10 years, the with, the, with the coming into force of the Constitution, we should be able to uh, uh, establish a universal, compulsory, basic education within 10 years. And free. Yes, and free. We, we are in our 27th year. It may be free, mm. maybe, uh, but it's neither universal or compulsory. We've never been able to do that. And you know that even in the educational sector, one comes and says, oh, we should have three years. You know, um, secondary, another comes and says you should have four years secondary and so forth. Even that sector, there's so much change of policy, which is detrimental, in my view, to the pursuit of a national policy. Take the same thing in, in energy. In 1975, at the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences, a professor of physics from Legon predicted that the resources of Akosom Bodam would be exhausted, would not be able to cater for the energy needs of Ghana within a, a short time. Mm. Now, if we had a long-term development policy in which both all sides of the political divide, say the 
and this year we will do this, and this year we will do this, and so forth. We would have planned effectively for generation of power, uh, replacement of equipment, and so forth. I used to be chairman of the Public Utility Regulatory Commission, and I saw all the various difficulties that the utility companies were saying, and so forth. We haven't done that. So we have doomed so this time, yeah. and they are saying, that, oh, this is because this one has broken down, so and so and so. Tell me, where do we have a long-term energy plan which has actually stuck? The same goes for so many aspects of our development. Infrastructure. Why are we talking of 220 roads? Roads should have been developed on a long-term basis yeah. without anybody thinking that, oh, this is that being done for my my constituency and so forth and so forth. A whole national plan yeah. in which we have a railroad. When I was a little child, uh, a schoolboy, I used to travel from Kumasi to Achimoto School by rail. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't happen it's anymore. Normal. There has been retrogression. 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 So this is where and... I think the kind of multi-party system that we have operated, which is not necessarily traceable to the mm -hmm. Constitution, but our own political culture, has actually thwarted our development endeavors. Right. Look, let's talk about the National Development Planning Commission. You have uh, brought a very clear example of the situation yes. of the Koreas, uh, mm -hmm. how they, uh, they put in place a long-term development plan for education, which yes. means that at the end of the tenure, they have uneducated workforce. But our National Development Planning Commission has said that it cannot work with the present long-term development plan of 40 years. Where do we go from there? Well, <clears throat> if not 40 years, some other term, maybe 20 years and so forth, there are certain things which cannot be done mm -hmm. on a short-term basis. basis. And like education. You must like be disappointed yes. the way our education exactly. system yes, is going. Yes. A certain things going to be done. I mean, in, the same thing happened in Malaysia, a long-term development. Um, I would also say our energy, our infrastructure development. We are a developing country. And sometimes when we bring the multipartism of developed countries, which are already developed, and they can afford to debate on... It's issues like abortion, homosexuality, whether the state should be involved in economic development and so forth. Because they already have they, systems they already in have place. all these things. But there's no government or party. There's no party here who doesn't believe in the state being involved in our development endeavors. In fact, that's the, why they're going to power. They want to use state power to develop. There's no argument about that. There's no argument that we should move from a, a colonial type of economy uh, where we produce raw materials for others to process into another um, economy where we are actually processing mm. our raw materials. There's no um, uh, argument that we, we should develop technology, you know. There's no argument that we should do industrialization. There's no argument about foreign investment. So there are some countries who say, oh, no, we don't need foreign so investment. So why are we not planning so why are we to not, get we're there? not planning on this? So when they talk about manifesto and so forth and so on, I suppose well, manifesto may be all right, but, you know, manifestos kind of really change the basic, you know, um, fundamentals of, of our economic planning needs. It cannot. And some of these things are actually set out in the directive principles of state policy that by a certain time we should have done so and so so. So why don't you move towards that area? Yeah. <clears throat> now, if multipartism means that we are unable to do this, and I'm saying that to that extent, multipartism must be looked at. Are you disappointed in, uh, in our quest for multi-party democracy and how far we have come in 27 years? We are not disappointed. Of course, it's very, 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 very vibrant, mm -hmm. first of all you must have a vibrant multi-party system to sort of organize elections and win and change one thing to another. But the winner takes all is hurting yeah. us, yes. is it not? Well, that's another issue. People get very, very sensitive on this winner takes all, but <laughs> it's a real issue. Because what does winner take all mean? It means that at by virtue of an election, and by virtue of the election of a president on a on the formula of 50 plus one, 50% plus one, 
all powers are transferred to one particular party. You can, I mean, in, uh, in the 2012, we got, got nearly 50-50, really, mm, yeah. if you remember. Yeah. Small difference. The entire power shifts. What does that mean? I've given the example of the change of uh, officials and so forth and so on. The change of contractors. Yeah. The change of lawyers, you know, law firms. I went to my my uh, my town in uh, one of those um, years, just after an election. Mm -hmm. And, you know, simple, barely literate young men who were involved in cocoa spraying had been rendered jobless. Uh, jobless. Why? Because they were supposed to belong to another party. Have you heard of this incredible situation? So I asked the DC, so where am I to send, to send these people? Mm -hmm. They don't belong to your party. So are they going to be jobless? You know, it, it doesn't make sense at all. It doesn't. You know. But how <coughs> so, can we work around this? Yes, well, we can work around it. Actually, um, people mm. may, uh, think that when you say sharing of power mm. is a retrogressive step. I believe that sharing of power means that you have an inclusive government. If we had an ideal situation, I would say, Let's have a coalition government. But you know, this is anathema to certain people. Mm. So, the next step is that let us define areas where a national approach is imperative. And let's take those. And let's that. take those things formulation of policies, appointment of certain key uh, people. For example, the appointment of the Electoral Commission. Mm. There's no reason why we should not have a formula for voting which will necessarily involve a substantial number of the opposition for members so that they know that he or she has been appointed nationally. I was appointed chairman of the um, Public Utilities Regulatory Commission in 1997. I was the first one to be appointed. I was told that when I was being appointed, the government in power consulted the opposition whether I was acceptable to them. This could be developed yeah. in key areas, you know, appointment of uh, Chief Justice, appointment of Electoral Commission, appointment of uh, IGP. Uh, IGP, appointment of Shrag, so that these people are not seen as political as, elements. Political, right, right. That's one way of moving things. But you know, I always remember Mandela, and Mandela, is noted for his magnanimity. And after having been you know, oppressed by this, he came and said, well, we will not return. And, uh, we will not resort to vengeance. But he also, he also um, uh, pressed for a national government. He had a government in which his oppressors were part of the government. And of course, uh, this went on only for one term, and the whole thing that went, went and we have this permanent majority from uh, national NAC and so forth. And many people think that this is not necessarily in the best interest of South Africa. So I am not, I am not uh, put off by the idea of a coalition government or even a national government. Uh, in Ghana, when you talk about national government, they think of union government. Mm -hmm. Union government was a peculiar contrivance of uh, a champon in order to perpetuate the rule of the military. Uh, so it wasn't a true thing. But there's no reason why you can't have something like what they have in Switzerland, in uh, many of the European countries, where multipartism doesn't necessarily mean, you know, <laughs> you, we are in and you are out. Many of these European countries have developed a certain culture of multipartyism, where there's a consensual approach to government, where they share power. And my humble view is that in a country like ours, which is a plural country with various people trying to become one nation, which was originally held together by the colonial power, and we are trying to help, 
it's not a bad thing at all to make sure that there is effective participation. But is this for feasible? Yes. Is it feasible it within feasible. our yes. uh, democratic structures? Yes, that's right. It is feasible. Why is it not feasible? It is feasible. If you have a system in which we say that we will have a government that is constituted by certain groups who are representing part in Parliament according to the proportion of their representation. I mean, this is a radical mm. idea, mm. but it is possible. Mm. It is not possible because we have been made to think that a coalition system is, a, is anathema. You know, this is the British approach and the American approach, and to some extent, the French approach. The French is probably worse, but Germany, Belgium, Switzerland, um, all these people practice consensual government with a multi-party <laughs> system. Nobody says they are not democratic. Only we don't hear of them because we don't see them as an example. And I'm saying that now Britain and America are not good models for, uh, for Ghana, in my view. Look at what is going on on this Brexit. Yeah. If they had realized from the word go that Brexit is such a critical thing that there should be a national approach. There they should have been have, a national would, consensus. Yes, 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 national consensus. They would have done better, in my view. Hmm. They have been partisan, trying to hold elections so that they would get majority and so on and so on. And look at what is going on in America. Partisan politics of the worst type, you know. If one party is uh, in control of uh, Congress, they will frustrate the other and so on. Another in charge of Senate, yeah. that's also another that's story. Yes. They are bad examples for us. And we have learned most of our political culture from these two countries. So it means it's time for us to change this or, or, or adapt to, to new ways? Uh, to, to bring new insights into what we have learned from them. Let me give you an example. In Iraq, when they got rid of Haddam Hussein, mm -hmm. they had elections. And the Shias won a majority. The Shias therefore tried to root out all the Sunni people. And the Americans said, oh, but this is not going to, if I should bring them in, you see, you should be inclusive. You should bring the Sunni people. So the Shia said, oh, you're denying us the results of our victory. This is what you do in your, your country. Whoever wins monopolizes. Why are you asking us? To do different. To differ. They are asking us to differ because they know that that is a recipe for Disaster. conflict and so forth. Look at what has happened in Iraq. Look at what's happened in South Sudan. Look at what's happened in so many other countries where there's an attempt to monopolize power on the basis of some sectarian or religious or even partisan basis. It never really. So you, your, your view is that these should be examples for us yes. to consider yes. electoral reform. Yes. yes, electoral certainly, but electoral reform should also be accompanied by the way we look at our executive structure, mm. you know. I think that people should be made to feel that they are all part of a new national experiment. We were not one people before. We came from, that's what Arthur Lewis called the plural society. He says in the plural society, majoritarianism, character is extreme, doesn't make sense at all. Because it means that whoever happens to be a majority, whether that majority revolves around a particular ethnic group or a particular religious group, must have permanent power, but that will not be conducive to nation building. These are things that we must consider and not follow blindly what other people did, mm. which is based on a certain ideology of the class system, which we don't have here. Yeah. Yeah. I spoke about electoral reforms, and yes. I know that it's something I can't do away uh, with you. as a Electoral being, reform, we mm. actually considered that. When we... Oh, we are talking about the, uh, but I want to talk about uh, the more basic thing about whether you, you have a priority system or uh, whether you have proportional representation. We of the Committee of Experts pointed out the merits and the merits of both systems. We actually went to Germany to study their uh, system of proportional representation, which is a modified form. And we, we want against a situation where by using the electoral system, you have one party rule. Yeah. You use the electoral system, you have one party rule. 
And so eventually, you don't have a, a, an inclusive government. It's not getting closer to that uh, situation uh, here. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't listen to us. Some of the things that they did not listen. If you read my book, you'll see some of the, my, 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 my lecture, and you'll see all these things. And now we're grateful to have you all on right, thank Hot you. Issues. It's yeah. a privilege to have okay, uh, someone you. as eminent as thank you, you very much. Uh, with us. So that's how we wrap up with Hot Issues. I was with Nana Dr. S.K.B. Asante. Thanks for your time.